I got into this routine, this mantra, talking to God. Part of my prayer would be, God, show me the way. Yeah. God, show me the way. And then one night, I'm laying in bed, I'm doing my thing. God, show me the way. And this voice from the abyss emerges and it says, Ed, you show me the way. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Thrive with Sharon podcast. I am Sharon Land. I am a licensed holistic psychotherapist, a studied mystic, a metaphysician, and a best-selling author recently this year. I'm very excited and proud to say. Uh, and I um, am continuing this journey with season three. I, we just we were going to cap it off, and I just. I am really enjoying all of the individuals who we are able to bring in front of you and the community is continuing to grow and it's really super exciting for me. And today I have uh, someone who I've met about five months ago and have just, I'm thrilled, just thrilled um, because he is, you know what you say when you find good people, you surround yourself with good people and you keep them there, right? And uh, Eben Britton is one of those individuals who is just, um, there are so many layers to him and I can't wait for you to actually hear him speak and, and, and hear this conversation. Um, but he is a former NFL athlete and now a yogi. And he right now is helping others live in their highest greatness as he is in flow towards his own. And I cannot wait for Eben to start to dip into this conversation. Eben, welcome to the conversation. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the community. Thank you, Sharon. I'm ex I'm really excited and honored to be here. Yeah, well, it's we were just chatting before we started recording, which is what always happens. And I said, I, I wish we were recording now. Um, <laughs> and so first, let's give a little context, because there are going to be people that really don't know much about you. So do you want to share a little bit about like, you know, how long have you been, well, how long were you working as a professional athlete? And then like, when did you make the transition? Mm, yeah, I can give some bullet points there. <laughs> I bet. Um, so I was born in New York City, lived in Brooklyn until I was 10. Come from a family that really wonderful people, athletes and artists. There was also a heavy atmosphere of alcoholism which myriad things spring out of that uh, so that was really the backdrop for my childhood and around the time I was eight years old I was at my grandparents house in Connecticut watching the summer news and on came the Jets and the Giants in training camp I just thought to myself, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I saw these gladiators smashing into each other. And it was like this incredible, violent ballet. And I just thought, that's what I want to do with my with my life. When I get older, I want to be one of those warriors. I want to be one of those gladiators. And my mom would never let me play. Finally, my freshman year of high school, with the help of my dad, I convinced her to let me play football. And... Pretty much from that moment on, freshman year of high school until I was 21 years old being drafted in the NFL, everything I did, how I carried myself, how I lived, how I thought, how I ate, how I trained was all in alignment with achieving this dream of playing professional football one day. Mm. Um, went to the University of Arizona, majored in creative writing, had a really was an All-American, team captain, all of that good stuff. Played really hard. I was a good football player. I was one of the most violent guys on the field always. That background of the alcoholism, there was a lot of rage in me. And football was this incredible outlet for me to get that out, express that in a way where it was in this container. So not only was it acceptable for that that rage and that violence to come out onto other individuals, but I was celebrated for it and I was yeah. praised for it. So football really worked for me in that way. And I became really good at it. 
I was physically gifted. I was always the biggest kid in my class. And freshman year of high school is 6'3", 230. Sophomore year of high school is 6'6", 270. Wow. Oh, my <laughs> and, gosh. <laughs> I, was a big, <laughs> I was always a big kid. And so I had that physical gift, and I really put it to use. And I did everything I could to maximize my physical potential and was very disciplined, was very committed. Like my whole life was about achieving this dream. So when I was 21, I actually left the University of Arizona early after my redshirt junior year. I could have stayed for one more season. There was something in me, though, that I felt my time in football, there was a, a clock running. There was a mm -hmm. There was a there was an amount of time that I had to play because I always had this love hate relationship with the game. Yep. Because it's brutal. It's really hard physically, mentally, emotionally. It's very stressful. You're running on adrenaline and cortisol mm -hmm. all the time. You're in this perpetual cycle. Now, I ended up playing 15 years when it was all said and done. High school, college, NFL. And for 15 years, year in, year out, it's this seasonal experience of preparing your body to play football, weight training, practicing, drills, film study, all of these things year in, year out. And then you're playing the season and then you're managing all the things that are coming in the season, the injuries and the bumps and the bruises and getting yourself ready to play and preparing for opponents. And then it, the season comes to an end. You have a little moment of rest and then you're right back into the grind for another nine months. Right. Um, and so I always had this, I think most guys who play football, there's this, this, <laughs> this tug of war of love and hate yeah. with it. There's so much we love about it. We love our brothers. We love, the team, we love the game, the sport. However, it's it's one of those things where you sacrifice a ton. Mm -hmm. You sacrifice everything. Like, yeah. I gave everything I had to play the sport at the level that I played it at. And, you know, it was honestly one of the most, a truly incredible experience in my life that yeah. laid the foundation for just about everything I'm doing now. Not only with what I learned being an athlete at that level, but also all the, the intangible human elements of that experience. Yes. You know? Yeah. So, <laughs> so when I was 21, I was drafted by the Jacksonville Jaguars, 39th overall in the second round in 2009, just to give you the bullet points there, four years in Jacksonville playing for the Jaguars, had a great rookie season, second year, ruptured the disc in my back, L5-S1, traumatic back injury, had severe sciatic nerve pain running down my right leg, playing through that, managing that with, um, with treatment and rehab and ice tubs and stem machines and all of these different modalities that you have access to at that level. It's basically when you're playing professional sports and each team has varying degrees of technology that's right. available um the base level is pretty damn good you know as far as yeah. what you have access to so if you're not 100 percent healthy you're definitely in the training room every day doing all sorts of things to give yourself the best opportunity to be in the best shape you can possibly be in yeah when you play step on the field to play in the games and so they're Second year ruptured disc halfway through the season. I'm still, I'm starting at right tackle, managing this back injury with uh, an, a laundry list rehab protocol on top of the pills and anything else I could get my hands on just to numb the pain, get myself to a place where I could compete right. essentially. Mm -hmm. We're running myself ragged, mm. you know, for <laughs> essentially. Uh, halfway through that season, dislocate my shoulder twice in one game playing against the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm done for the year, have to have season-ending shoulder surgery, get my shoulder fixed. Going into my third season, my back was still an issue. 
the lockout happens in 2011, the, the owners lock the players out. So it was the reverse of a strike because we couldn't come to terms on a new collective bargaining agreement. Mm. So there was no, no spring ball, no off season workouts, no off season practices. And we came right in for training camp in August and I come back, my shoulder is better, still have this back injury that I'm dealing with, horrific sciatic nerve pain, no power in my right leg, my right leg's atrophying, can barely feel my right foot on the ground. And <clears throat> so two weeks into training camp, I decided to go have back surgery. I have a discectomy, fly up to North Carolina, have this surgery. It's life-changing in that moment. I had spent the last 18 months dealing with this ruptured disc and if you know anything about the spine i I know you do sharon but for the listeners you know your discs so you've got your vertebrae and then in between each vertebrae are these discs and they're 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 cushions essentially that are filled with this gel and you can have a bulging disc where something happens, the vertebrae impinge on the disc and it squeezes the disc and that presses on the nerve. Or you can have like what I had, which was the next level and more trauma to the to the tissue, but there's an impingement in the vertebrae. This happened while I was doing these back squats in a workout. And the disc literally ruptures and that fluid that's inside the disc squeezes out. It bursts through the side of the disc and it's putting pressure on the nerve and it's very acidic that Mm -hmm. that gel like substance so that's what i had so the guy went in there did a discectomy he shaved that part of the disc off which took all the pressure off the nerve and when i came out of surgery it was like somebody had pulled the a piece of glass out of the electrical circuit board of my body wow and i realized that for the last 18 months i had been in a constant state of fight or flight Yeah. on top of my profession, you know, yeah. which you're already in that I would, mine was even further exacerbated because I was in this constant state of pain from the moment I woke up till I went to sleep at night. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that sizzling sensation that I had been experiencing day in, day out for 18 months was all of a sudden gone. I could have burst into tears. It was like all the pain was gone. Um, for me, that back surgery was necessary. Um, and I think that's an interesting conversation in itself of when you've experienced some sort of traumatic injury to your body, when do you decide you need to have surgery? When do you do the things or, um, utilize the practices, the procedures and processes in your own life that allow the body, the opportunity to heal itself, which we know it can do. Yeah, I didn't have that time then, you know. Yeah. So, and who knows? You know, I'm at a point now where I don't know if we ever need surgery. Yeah. Maybe it it's good. Sometimes I was I'm sure glad that you know Western medicine has innovations <laughs> like that that they could do what they did for me in that time. Yeah. Um, well, but so I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's a really interesting point, though, the intersect of, you know, Western medicine, I was going to say Eastern medicine, but I believe it's more than just that, right? I think that Uh like, we do, you know, the way that our human brains work, we always want to like polarize one thing with another thing, right? But, but I really do believe that like you Western medicine is, is, is necessary. And in your case, at the moment in time, in your, in your journey, where you were, it was what was best for you. Um, at that time. And like you said, had you had more time, more expansion, more opportunity, yeah. more all of those things, then maybe you would have had had different choices available to you. But at that point, that was the best choice that you had. Um, but you kind of gave a little bit of a peek into your mindset now, right? Which is, yeah. which is the belief that any and all things are truly heal- healable and transformable um, without necessarily needing medication or a knife or a surgeon or something yes. like that. So maybe we can thread the needle through that moment to the journey of, you know, one of, one of the many things that I am I'm very, feel very connected to with you is your, the way that your mind has the opportunity and ability to embrace this kind of the great all 
Mm, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, the duality of things, um, finding the balance in things, or maybe instead of balance, maybe harmony and coherence, right? Mm. Um, so tell from that point, so we can kind of bring us into like the the even larger expression of Eben now, right? Like how where where were you guided? And then how did that how did that bring you to where you are now? So to sum up my football career, there was that back injury, got it fixed in surgery. Eleven weeks after surgery, I'm starting playing some of the best football in my life. I'm hit with intense back spasms to the point where I can't play in this game against the Steelers. If people are interested, I've told this story many times. I'm just going to give you the, the bullets here from here out. But 11 weeks after surgery, discover there's an infection in the disc. So I have to go on eight weeks of intravenous antibiotics. I'm done for the season. Work my way back. Last year in Jacksonville was basically a disaster the team is sold the coach is fired i get benched halfway through the year i'm i'm totally heartbroken and crushed and i end up being a free agent signed with the bears my fifth year which is my first year in chicago i have a really incredible season i'm the sixth man swing tackle playing monster tight end 25 plays a game it was really the football experience I had always dreamed of having. Oh, wow. Because I was on this in this incredible city with this team that was totally historic and beloved by the fans and one of the first NFL teams, this whole thing, great franchise, incredible team, great experience, a very magical year. Come back the next year, it all falls apart again. The business of football review rears its ugly head oh. once again. And... I realized that I, I'm done with the game. That season, my appendix ruptured halfway through the year. Had to have an emergency happen. Oh my me. god! <laughs> you know, and I told this. I told this story uh, this past weekend in this virtual breath and body clinic I put on, and I used my football career, my medical history, as a case study for this concept of. <clears throat> The physical pain that we experience in our lives lives being a manifestation of our psychological happenings, the things that we're experiencing psychologically, mentally, and emotionally, the things that we're avoiding, the things that we're really pushing on and resistance to. And so when you look at all the injuries that I experienced in my life, they all came on my right side, my masculine side. Interesting. You know, it, started, it started with my shoulder, and then it was down my right leg with the the rupture in the disc was to the right pressing on the sciatic nerve in my right leg my whole right leg basically shut off I had a a smaller injury to my right knee Uh, my appendix was on the right also getting all of these signs from the universe from my from spirit from source not listening to that not following my gut instinct so it literally blew out (laughs) my shoulder my whole football career, Sharon, was about me proving to the world how big and scary and yeah. tough I was. And I w- literally was destroying myself in the process, you yeah. know, not listening to the messages that were coming through. And I told this story, which I don't think I've ever told on a podcast before. I told it at, at, in, the, in the clinic that I did, but going into my senior year of, of high school football, you know, I'm committed to the University of Arizona, full football scholarship. I've got a dozen football scholarships offered to me. I'm a team captain. I'm all state. I'm all everything. This young superhero in the making. And a week into training camp of my senior year, my last year of high school football, I would wake up and just burst into tears because I didn't want to go. It was so hard. It was so brutal. Like, I felt yeah. like looking back, my head coach totally lost his mind that season and he was really pushing us hard. And I just, I would wake up in the morning, burst into tears. It was the last thing I wanted to do. And my mom said to me, Hey, Eb, you know, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. And there was something in me that was in complete resistance to that, even though that was the, 
That was the release I was really praying for. Yeah. Later that day, my dad drove across town and picked me up after practice and just like talked me out of it and said, Eb, you know, this is such a massive opportunity for you. And you could do something that no one in our family has ever had the opportunity to do. And, and so, of course, I stuck it out. And I'm glad that I did. Mm-hmm. I really am. I'm truly glad because of the, the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience that I gained through sticking out, sticking it out through that tough time. And while I'm glad I didn't quit, there was something very real and true in that waking up and bursting into tears and being in so much resistance to going back to play. Yes. That if it had been acknowledged in some way by myself, perhaps I could have had, I could have reoriented my relationship to it. In a, in a way. Yes, exactly. It, because I'm sure that many people who were listening were thinking, then if you had honored the fact that you were waking up and crying and panicking or was experiencing the anxiety of the decision and the next step, then, then that would mean that you wouldn't do it. But that's uh-huh. not the answer. Right, right. Right. Exactly. The answer yeah. is to create the coherence to, to address the conflict. Right. Yes. Uh, and... So that that conflict, looking back, became something that would it would emerge throughout my career. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. this inner conflict of being in utter agony and despair about going back to to play more football and never acknowledging that, just burying it and going back out there and popping the pills and doing the stuff and Mm -hmm. whatever I had to do to get back out on the field. And, you know, exactly like you said, acknowledging that doesn't mean that we necessarily just have to quit or walk away from it. But the acknowledgement of it is really the key thing that I never did, you know? Right. Well, you know, I think that the context of that was you were still an adolescent in many Uh aspects of the word, right? So we were very much reliant on by our support system. And that's the interesting aspect of that kind of energetic vibration that becomes part of the dance that we dance life through, which wasn't originally our dance, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure people who were surrounding you and supporting you, maybe not just your mom and dad, but other individuals as well, society, schools, you know, sports, whatever, they looked at things in a very binary way. It's either this or that on or off, you know, black or white. Right. And because we all, I believe are these beautiful, energetic, intuitive beings um, uh, that are many in many ways buried underneath a lot of, you you know, the external crap that we, (laughs) you know, that we're trying to move through um, that, that there was a knowing of your greatness. There was a Mm. knowing of your capacity um, and not from an egoic standpoint, but yes. of this like true, like this deep engine and motor and burning and expression and, you know, yes, all of the things that were there and available for you. And this wasn't a vehicle, right? Football mm-hmm. was a vehicle for you to be able to show, yes. that, be that, express that, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, and And I think that that's probably where the encouragement went you know, for you to to, Uh to do that. Um, But it's just like you said, there's so many nuances to it that Uh you don't believe that you don't have time to even look into the nuances. You don't have time to really feel into that. People who are supporting you don't have the capacity to. And so I love the fact that you're sharing now with your, Mm -hmm. your community who are attracted to come and work with you through the the way that you are able to serve with breath and movement and intersecting the science and spirituality of the body and the mind and mm. all of that 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 people are able to hear that because I think we're still all very much seeped in this very transactional lifestyle right of this life. yeah yeah it's really interesting to me. It's really interesting to me. And so the way the 
the breath and body clinic came about for me was I was at the gym about a month ago and doing an exercise I've done a thousand times and I had an unbelievable back spasm. My back totally spasmed and seized up. And like I said uh, before we started recording, like I'm going through a lot of real life shit right now. There's big yeah. life transitions happening, mm -hmm. literally and psychologically. Mm -hmm. My relationship with money in particular is going through a complete metamorphosis. Mm. And, um, you know, my low back has been, since I was 12 years old, my low back has been the epicenter of where all of my stress reveals itself. Mm -hmm. And the low back, it's all about support, survival, financial, oh, your basic needs. fear of money, yeah. all that stuff, yeah. right? So I was in this moment where I'm totally shifting into a new way of being in my relationship with money in particular. And of course, I'm at the gym and I have this massive back spasm that literally sits me down for about it was about three or three to five days and i got i had this really incredible opportunity to just sit with it and be with this thing and all the stuff is coming up this fear recognizing how if i have this horrible feeling inside that when my bat when my body is unable to perform i'm not worth anything and Ugh. looking at my fear around money and scarcity and lack and all of these things. And it's all coming in and I'm just having to sit there on the couch and just feel into this thing. And into my head pops this idea. Hey, I've heard this book. I've been wanting to read it uh, by Dr. John Sarno, Healing Back Pain. <laughs> Have you read it? No. <laughs> I'm going to read that. And, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> It's an incredible book. It's an incredible book. And um, basically everything in it is things that I've learned and experienced throughout my life. And this doctor's articulating it in a way that's reminding me of everything I know and have yeah. navigated for God knows how long. And essentially his, his thesis is while physical injury and structural damage these things do occur. This is These are real things. Our body, we experience physical trauma, and that can elicit pain in various parts of your body. However, the pain that we're experiencing is not necessarily due to some physical injury. Correct. And he goes, once you've, once you've ruled out any serious injury or a serious disease like cancer or something like that, 90 Nine percent of the time, the pain is the result of repressed psychological stress, and he calls it TMS, uh, tension myositis syndrome. I think he calls it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it took me into this incredible rabbit hole, where all of a sudden I started just getting all of these downloads and these insights, and it was like, Ed, you know this. Like this has been your life journey of yeah unpacking this realm of experience this interconnection between psychology and physiology and all the things that we do the book that i wrote the ebb and flow basic tools to transform your life is essentially everything i've learned and practiced in my own life to create true holistic well-being in myself and allow me the opportunity to live a life free of pain because of all the physical damage that i've taken on and you know the other thing that john sarno illuminates in his book which i think is a really important component to anytime we're thinking about or dealing with pain in our body is your body is built to heal like your yes. body has evolved over millions of years yeah. and it is a master of healing so mm -hmm. the idea that we walk around with particularly due to conditioning of western medical doctors yep. that the back injury you experienced 10 years ago is causing the pain you're experiencing today is just it's almost a ridiculous idea because yeah. the body has healed that injury yeah so now i would take it a step further just in what i've experienced now because of the injuries that we've experienced or looking at the body as this 
3D rendering of the energetic psychological happenings that we occurrences. Mm -hmm. So if you think of your body as like a globe of a planet, and on a globe, you've got all the countries, you've got Africa and the United States, and you go even deeper and you get into the states and the cities and the places. Like our body is the same thing with that where each region of the body correlates to a specific psychological happening. And this yes. has been mapped out in all sorts of traditions, traditional yes. Chinese medicine and Ayurveda yes. and yeah. reflexology, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so this isn't really new concepts. However, it's important to articulate because like you said, we've got this, we've come to this interesting place where everything is so compartmentalized. Yeah. And everything is so dualistic. Yes. Like, oh, I got a shoulder injury. Well, it's because I play sports. And it's right. like, well, not necessarily. Right. <laughs> you know? It's like your shoulder got injured. Yes, because you're perhaps it it was triggered by a, a movement or something that occurred physically. However, there's a whole thing, especially if you want to bring Tantra into the conversation where Tantra is the 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 philosophy of everything we experience in our lives, our soul calls it in. Yes. In the in accordance to the evolution that we have to go on. Mm -hmm. So I had the back spasm. It took me down deep into this rabbit hole of remembering who I am, what I've learned, some of my deep, true, unique. Sorry, there's a helicopter. Can you hear it or no? No, no we're good. That's so funny. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> they, your pods work. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. So it took me down this deep rabbit hole of remembering and really being. It was this incredible experience of spirit acknowledging or forcing me to acknowledge one of my really unique gifts that is the result of the pain that I've experienced in my life, you know? Um, and it took to take it even further. I don't know where I was going with this other than this place, all the stuff that we're seeing come into the mainstream conversation the mainstream consciousness of the breath work and the meditation and the ice tubs and the plant medicine all of these things are tools for stabilizing our nervous system yes. or restabilizing our nervous system yes. and you know it's really i think we're on the it's it's kind of amazing to me where we are i don't you know who god knows what phase of it we're in but we're truly in the midst of an evolution of our species and yeah. our consciousness and how yeah. we how we view and perceive reality yeah. and a really important component of that to me is understanding this interconnection between physiology and psychology and where they meet is at the nervous system the nervous yeah. system is the it's the barrier it's the membrane it's the highway of of communication between these two realms of ourselves. Yeah. And when you look at whatever trauma we've experienced as children, whatever that looks like, that left an imprint in our nervous system. And chances are we weren't surrounded by anyone who really knew how to mm -hmm. balance that out or bring peace back in or realign it. And then we get into adulthood and everything we do is so narrowly focused. Everything is this task that we got to get done. And mm -hmm. there's an element of stress and we're all perpetually in fight or flight. Yep. And so we're desperate for these ancient practices and tools yes. and things that are just built into our nature that we've been disconnected from because of modern, the way modern society functions. Mm-hmm. That we're all like, God, just give me something to calm my nervous system down. Yeah. Yeah. Outside of me. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's but yeah. but but the the key is that it's all inside, right? And and you yes. said this earlier yes. that, you know, I'm gonna phrase it a little bit differently, but saying the same thing that like I trust in the infinite wisdom of our bodies and that any yeah. anything that our bodies tell us 
is a sign of health, right? Mm. But the way that our brains and the way that especially Western medicine and and we can also like go down the rabbit hole of like systems and structures and patriarchal, you know, like all of the things that like yeah. design us for being the consumer, right? Of saying, yes, exactly. Staying all straight in the system, right? <laughs> yes, we, we all fit into a little squiggle or a square, right? And yeah. which isn't really the way that we're meant to exist, right? And so what we what we're told when we say oh i have this migraine or i have this back pain or i have this thing they're just like oh it's because you know you you you're an athlete or oh it's because um you know you're in front of the computer too long or oh it's right, whatever right. it is right and uh-huh. i have this pill i have this prescription i have this thing that you need to do and it's going to fix make it all better right and then what happens <laughs> is then the symptom goes somewhere else uh-huh Right. So it goes from Uh your head to your heart, to your spleen, to your left leg, to your whatever it is. Right. And it's your body's way of continuing to say the same thing over and over again. And it's it's, so our body is a sign of health. The other Mm. thing I wanted to reflect back to what you said about the spine, the nervous system. So I'm like, I am like so geeking right now because this is like my, this is my, I love yeah. this so much. This is what I <laughs> love to do. Um, that the other aspect from the spiritual lens, right? Is that um, what is the spine and where is the nervous system? The nervous system is, you know, it's in our, it's located in the base of our brain and in our spine, right? Mm-hmm. So if you look at, spiritual context, right? There is a specific numerology to the amount of, you know, vertebrae that we have in our mm. and how much you right? And that the spine represents life. But in mm. all little human minds, we think, okay, life means like me being able to breathe in this physical body, right? And so when this mm. physical body isn't able to breathe anymore, that means the life is gone. But actually life is energy and energy is infinite, right? Mm. So the infinite life exists inside of us Mm. in our spine Mm -hmm. and our nervous system (laughs) is um a vehicle it's an instrument Uh, of of life right that helps to maintain and preserve the infinite of life right in Mm. this life form and other life forms right and other existences whether it's physical or non-physical and tangible and non-tangible right so (laughs) so to sit there right um and think that we know is preposterous to me yeah 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 exactly (laughs) one of the things that i i i've just really dug about listening to your podcast and in conversation and just kind of like being in you know circle of friends together and all that the thing and i think i said this in the beginning is that you where you have landed which i'm like so excited about because you are a beautiful representation of 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 life and expression of life right and so there are people Mm -hmm. who who look up to you there are people who you're here to help right just through you moving through life is that there is no binary answer. And as soon mm. as you think you know, then you're done. Yeah, you've lost it. You've lost it. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I was thinking this thing this morning, coming out of yoga class, and I was thinking, man, and Kat and I have this conversation all the time. If you only knew how powerful you were, <sighs> you could have anything you want. The, the the big thing is, do you know what you want? Right. You know, because so we're so fucking powerful. We're the thoughts, the words, the actions. We're so powerful. And most of us are just, we're just running around in circles, literally like chickens with our heads cut off, mm-hmm. trying to do this thing or chase the money or chase a relationship or chase the material stuff or get lost in how we were fucked over or somebody did something to us or we're wounded and all of this stuff. Yeah. It's like, imagine if you focused your energy on what you really wanted or what you really, or what was really important to you, man, you could do anything. Literally you can move mountains. 
mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and have- it's just like what you said, we get on, on in varying degrees, we get locked in on being convinced that it's some way or yes. that it's got to be like this or there's no way that that could be possible or whatever it is, mm-hmm. you know, all those mm-hmm. limiting ideas, beliefs mm-hmm. that we're carrying around because of X, Y, or Z, where we come from, the culture, what we've allowed ourselves to think is true. Uh huh. And just 100%. like you said, like we're just this embodiment of, of universe, of source, of God, like in this thing, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like that in and of itself is so wise, right? That, that, that source was smart enough to know that the way to maintain the infinite is to place itself in all things. Mm, mm-hmm, yeah. Right. Because wild, if, source, yeah. if source was just like, well, I'm the all perfect, all knowing, right? Like, so <laughs> it's just me, put me up on a pedestal, right? I'm the hero, <laughs> right? Like just all come to me and I'm going to teach you. Then source wouldn't be here anymore because they'd be like, somebody would be like, right? One person, uh-huh. right? One thing, one, <laughs> one entity. But that's the infinite wisdom of, of source, right? Is that you, pl- you it's placed inside of all of us. So no matter how high vibrational, low vibrational, whatever it is that we, whatever speak it is that we want to say, like how off course, on course, uh, evolved or not, it doesn't matter because it's every single one of us Yes, has the universe, has source, has that representation inside of us and mm. all we need to do is just be with it get quiet yeah right instead of say yeah. you know these things and and i don't know how you feel about this and 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 i'm it's not everything but i believe that sometimes people get very misguided about things like signs right so mm. um you know and it, it's just another way to kind of create this egoic validation, right? So like, oh, please show me this, blah, blah, blah. And then like, oh, see, that was the sign, right? Well, (laughs) well, we, we, we are the sign. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We are the sign. We are the sign of the magic. We are the (laughs) sign of the transformation. We are the sign of all of those things. Like it's here, right? And everything, and if we can acknowledge that, then everything else is too. Yeah. Everything, yeah. not just yeah, that, you know, a, a number. That's or... a great point. <laughs> Such a great point. I've yeah. gravely misinterpreted dreams to the point where I've made my entire life about a dream, yeah. only to realize <laughs> that the dream was actually just showing me something about myself yeah. and a belief that I held, and it yeah. wasn't actually that this person or this thing was the answer that I was looking for. Oh my if gosh. That makes sense. You know? Totally. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I guess that's kind of a riff off of what you're saying. Like we can really literally be and do any and all things. Totally. You can do whatever side. you want. Right. Totally. On either side. Right. So like we, but we can, we were, we have to be very mindful about manufacturing right versus um being my my daughter um i was a professional equestrian and my daughter was Mm. taking lessons and and she was training with uh probably one of the best trainers that i've ever seen Mm. in motion at all he was a literal savant he could see anything and everything and he was just like Mm. a blessing to us in our lives and she was riding this very challenging horse that no one really wanted to ride and she Mm figured her out. And it was kind of a little bit of an ego boost. She was still very young. She was like probably 12 years old. Right. But, Mm. um, and so she really got into the whole thing of like controlling the strides. And so in jumping, you know, there's like a certain, there's a distance that you want the horse's stride to be. And like, you have to count the amount of strides between distances and how you take the turn. And it's, it's very scientific. It's, but it's also an art, right? Sure. Dancing with another living being. And Mm. so she would get every spot, she'd get every turn, she'd get all this stuff. And everybody's like, yeah, you know, and he looked at her and he was just like, he would smoke like a sieve. He was like, he was like, that's disgusting. <laughs> and she's like, you know, and, and he said, you're manufacturing everything. Uh-huh. He said, where's the art? Mm. Where is your horse in this? Mm. Where are you letting go and trusting? Mm. 
where are you actually Love letting that. her show up and greet you underneath? And I was like, oh, <laughs> man, right? And But if you uh -huh. think about it, how many times do we manufacture our existence? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's so good. And it makes me think of a, a handful of things. The first thing I wanted to share was going back to following the signs, looking for the signs, God show me the way. And mm -hmm. I'm, I have a prayer is a, is a, is a daily tool for me. I'm yes. always praying. Yeah. And there was this moment six months ago, eight months ago, earlier this year. And I got into this routine, this mantra talking to God. Part of my prayer would be God show me the way. Yeah. God, show me the way. And then one night, I'm laying in bed, I'm doing my thing, God, show me the way. And this voice from the abyss emerges, and it says, Eb, you show me the way. Eb, you show me the way, man. I'll give you whatever you want, brother. Right. I'll give you whatever you want. But what do you want? You <laughs> got to show me the way. You got to live what you want. You're asking right. for X, Y, and Z? Yeah. Okay. Where do you come in and start getting into action, taking those steps? Because this is really about you showing me where we're going. Yeah. Like, yes. yeah, dude, I'll give you anything. That's anything right. Anything you want. Right. You know? And that was like a ton of bricks hit me. Mm -hmm. Of Oh, shit. You know? I'm still waiting for the sky to part, for God to give me the answer. <laughs> you know? And God's like, dude, you're the answer. You right. show me the way yes like yes i will when you need it i'll light the path i'll give you the signal i'll validate you i'll let you know you're on the right path but you got to know you're on the right path dude right and that's been a big mantra for me mantra is not doesn't really describe it you know you know how these things are sharon it's hard yeah. to put into words it's hard yeah. to articulate this yeah. experience that we're having this this new paradigm mm -hmm. I've been moving into, evolving into of, I spent my whole life looking for somebody to tell me I was doing it right. Oh, God, like, yeah. Hey, somebody, mom, dad, so-and-so, tell me I'm doing it right. Tell me I'm going the right way. Is this mm -hmm. good enough? And this last year has been all about, do I think I'm going the right way? Yeah. Do I, is it good enough for me? Yeah. Am I doing good enough for me? That's all that fucking matters at this, at the, in this moment. Right. Now that doesn't mean I, I totally recognize the importance of community and love yeah. and support and tribe. I'm all about that. Family is maybe the most important thing for me fundamentally. Yeah. And just my own well being is having my people, being able to take care of my people, having my people to be around me and be with yeah. and, I'm in a moment in my life where I really have to start practicing being good enough for myself. That's right. You know, and, um, mm. and then thinking about that and then whatever it is you're doing and mastery and looking for the signs and thinking and the difference between being a vehicle of spirit and manufacturing the performance yeah for me it's been that dance has become me getting really good at emptying myself yeah of all of my ideas about what it's supposed to look like or that it's got to be good and just being available to source spirit god to be able to move through me like that's when i was at my best when i was a football player mm. i stepped on the field and i was just a vehicle yeah. for spirit to move through me when i started thinking about it my fucking football career started crumbling around me yeah literally yeah. i couldn't play anymore because i was just in my head like okay i gotta take this step and do this i'd never thought about it right you right. know 
Right. Because you're like looking to recreate a feeling that came from the validation yes. from the thing that you did right. And and there's so much, there's so many layers to it, right? Because there's also a lot of people, the better you do, the more people are counting on you to do. Of course. You know, all of the yeah. things. It's not just like you being egoic. It's 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 uh-huh. the way that it's all designed, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's why uh, I, I, I love athletes. I love the athletic mind. I, I believe that it's pure state. It's probably one of the most beautiful um, ways to live in your expression and to be disciplined mm. and all of the things and, and really work with the mind and the holistic aspect. However, mm-hmm. I think like commercial sports, right? Um, professional sports, the, it's it's unfortunately just so fraught with um, all of these tools to help to keep people to perform, right? That aren't healthy. Yeah, yeah. They're not healthy for oh, us, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, so it so that has to be factored into the context of what your experience was and what a lot of people's experiences are in their craft. And I think that mm. what you're saying now is like you found yourself in this place where you're still growing, you're still expanding, you're still challenging yourself to be of this expression, to be the instrument, to be the thing to flow, Mm -hmm. to allow source to flow through you. And it's, it's a constant practice. Yes. Right. That is for sure. And that (laughs) that is your life's work. So Mm -hmm. no longer is your life's work, the X, Y, Z thing that you're going to go show up for between, you know, at the hours of two to three, it's your life's work is you being available at any and all times yes be the instrument because it comes as you're going to get your smoothie it comes as mm-hmm. you're flying on the plane it comes as you're right you're you are the expression of you the walking talking living breathing version of your service right as you become yes the of and um and that's that's for me it it just makes my heart just bubble right to see you and you know you referred to cat um to see cat also in that and you know many people who were we share in common that you know to be on this journey and to be a witness to that um and holding space for that to me is just the most powerful way to connect as human yeah. beings you know and as spiritual yeah. beings no doubt about it no doubt about it <laughs> yeah so good well evan I knew this conversation was going to be great. So good. So it, fun. It was so, so much fun. And it's great because the two of us have never had an opportunity, just the two of us to talk. <laughs> so, I know. <laughs> this has been so wonderful as well. And I just know the community is going to um, really get so much um, from what you've shared. And so what is the best way for people to continue to stay in touch with you? I know that you just did the virtual breath and body clinic, and you're going to be doing that again, but you know, how can people find out uh, more about, you know, how they can connect with you, how you might be able to, uh, provide the, with them with some things to, uh, to be able to, on their, to help them on their own evolution. Um, well, you can always listen to my podcast, the ebb and flow that's on all your streaming platforms on YouTube. Um, I wrote a book, same title, the ebb and flow, basic tools to transform your life. Super basic, simple practices, philosophy on how to cultivate true well-being. Um, and then on Instagram is probably the most where I'm posting, you know, I'm, I'm the most active on Instagram at eds britain and then looks like by the time this episode comes out there will definitely be a link and a landing page that you can find on my instagram we're looking to do heal and flow our next heal and flow event which is what we love to do the most it's yoga breath work ice tubs great food great people turn you on to great supplements it's an incredible time two-day experience we're doing our next one in March of 2024 in Wimberley, Texas. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, all of that stuff you can find on my Instagram at EDS Britain. Awesome. Awesome. And then will you be doing another virtual? Um, yeah. So I don't. <laughs> what do you call it? Yeah, there will <laughs> definitely be another one sooner than later. I don't have a specific date, though. Okay. All right. So people just need to stay in touch. Stay connected. Stay in touch. 
Yeah. If you want to reach out, you can always send an email to contact at ebonbritton.com. Awesome. That's so wonderful. It has been such a joy to have you today. And I hope that you'll come back again uh, because there's just so many things that um, I just know we can we can speak into and that you can really share um, some beautiful magic. Thank you, Sharon. Definitely. I'm here. You just let me know. Would love to do that again. Love this convo. You're the best. Oh, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for being here. And thank you everyone for listening today. It has been such a treat to have Evan here. And we, of course, want to hear your feedback, your comments. Um, we're both pretty uh, interactive on especially Instagram. Um, but this, if you want to see this, this will actually be also on YouTube. So you can actually see us together. Uh, Love and it. Um, yeah. Uh, and so thank you so much. Send your messages, write your questions in the comments, and we'll be happy to get back to you. And until the next time, keep thriving, keep staying in your peace. And we just love that you're here and we love that we get to thrive together. Oh.